really appreciate uh, him putting six hours of drive time into getting right here. <laughs> um, before moving to BTT, well, let me finish that part. So he previously was the senior scientist and program manager of our fisheries habitat ecology program in my group here at Moat. Um, he started as a postdoc and worked his way up, and I can tell you, he rose pretty quickly from postdoc to staff scientist to senior scientist, and we take the, the, um, that designation of senior scientist pretty seriously, so he was a rapid advancer. And Aaron is responsible at BTT as developed uh, director of science and conservation. He's responsible for formulating and implementing BTT's science and conservation plan. Joelle and Wilson, who has her master's degree, is the program manager of the Tarpon Juvenile Habitat Program at BTT. Um, as BTT's Juvenile Tarpon Habitat Program Manager, Joe Ellen is in charge of all things juvenile tarpon related. This includes juvenile tarpon habitat research projects from South Carolina to the Florida Keys, mapping of juvenile tarpon habitat, and education to the public through presentations. She's a native of Charlotte Harbor, born in Punta Gorda, and a self-proclaimed aquaholic. <laughs> Joellen spends her free time fishing Charlotte Harbor with her husband and two dogs. So they're going to talk to us about the importance of mangrove habitat through um, the results that they've seen in their own work. The importance of mangrove habitat to fish populations and what we should be doing about that. All right. Thanks, Ken. So Joel and I are going to uh, tag team the presentation um, this evening. I'm going to give some background on work that's uh, been done on mangrove fish habitat, fish mangrove habitat associations. And Joel's going to jump in uh, with some of the more specific stuff that we're building up on that uh, for tarpon. All right, so a big motivation, of course, uh, is the value of the recreational fisheries in Florida. Um, BTT is uh, put out grants for a few studies. Uh, one found that the Everglades region um, economic, annual economic impact to recreational fisheries was a billion dollars a year. Um, this was a number of years ago, uh, so it's certainly higher with the improving economy. Just the Florida Keys recreational fishing is 765 million a year. If you look at just the flats fishery for bonefish tarpon and permit, it's about 460 million dollars a year. These are pretty major parts of the state's economy. Going a little bit closer, the Charlotte Harbor tarpon fishery is about 110 million a year, and this is just Florida resident anglers. It's not the tourists who come here and pay the guides, so that real number is much higher. It's probably that much spent a week in Boca Grande Pass, I think. Uh, the Treasure Coast tarpon uh, fishery, a uh, similar study, considerably lower. Um, it's not because of fewer anglers. Uh, my guess is it's because the habitat over there is in pretty poor shape. They don't have nearly the fishery um, diverse fish, fishery that places like Charlotte Harbor have. So statewide, the saltwater recreational fishery has an annual economic impact of about seven and a half billion dollars a year. Uh, you can look at the state uh, numbers for all kinds of parts of the economy and this is a pretty significant one. Unfortunately, um, people in the recreational fishery sector, even the commercial fishery sector, uh, trying to get them to do all one thing, it's like herding cats. Um, so that's a pretty tough sell but I don't know if you're paying attention to the Everglades issue. Um, they just had something like 350 fishermen show up in Tallahassee yesterday uh, to try and get the Senate to pass that bill for the Everglades, and the Senate did. The House is going to be a, a, a bigger issue. So this gives us some leverage. Um, we just got to work a little bit harder at um, using that leverage, and we're getting better. So with that uh, as a start, basically what we're talking about is that mangroves are a part of what we call a coastal habitat mosaic. You take any habitat, whether it's uh, sandy beaches or seagrass or mangroves, uh, the list goes on, coral reefs, and none of them are, are okay by themselves. They have to be part of a mosaic. There has to be a mix. Right? They're feeding off each other to some extent. That's part of the system, part of ecosystem. But in addition, the fish that we work on, a lot of different species of fish, 
utilize different parts of this habitat mosaic throughout their life cycle. And we're going to talk about that a bit. So mangroves are fantastic, but they're only fantastic if they're within the context of all the other things that are around them. So for uh, uplands, for example, this is a great picture of this. Uh, you can see in the upper right, what am I doing? I've got, I actually got this. Um, mangroves here, some nice back country here, snook for sure, but then you see this creek go way back up off the screen, up into the uplands. Um, this is not just here, snook and tarpon will be way up here as, and then you slowly expand their utilization of these habitats and then they're using everything. Right? But you have to, you can't have habitat fragmentation, you got to have connectivity. And I'll talk about these themes a lot and, and Joellen will as well. Um, but that's why I wanted to start with this. This is actually from the south coast of Cuba, um, uh, one of our study sites because it's pristine. It really is untouched as far as habitat manipulation, so it's a great comparison for what we do in Florida. So habitat and fisheries, um, kind of some generalities from the ecology world that I'll throw out here. First is that the amount of habitat greatly influences the total abundance of your fish species. So let's talk about snook. If you don't have the mangrove creeks that are nurseries, that's going to limit how much habitat or how, many, how big your fish population can be. That becomes what we call a bottleneck. Um, if you, the more of that juvenile habitat you lose, doesn't matter what fisheries management does, you can stop fishing altogether, you're still going to max out at a population size that's not what it would be naturally with healthy habitats. But in addition to just having the habitat there, it's also about the quality of the habitat. You can have, and this is a problem with a lot of stuff we do, you can have a mangrove creek that from the surface looks great, but if the water quality is bad, or you had seagrass in there, that all dies off, then it's not a high quality habitat, and that's going to affect fish survival, abundance, growth, etc. Habitat connectivity, which I just talked about, is also really important. If you're a juvenile snook and you come out of a creek and all of a sudden there's six miles of open water before you can get to your next stage, habitat stage, uh, you're in trouble. So just kind of three generalities that I, I throw out there to keep in mind as, as we talk through all this this evening. So the problem in Florida is that even with all the other stuff that's, that's going on with management, uh, harvest, and everything else, the fisheries are already running a deficit. And that's uh, this quick list here. Florida's lost about 50% of its mangroves since uh, pre-development times, estimated. That's part of an over 9 million uh, wetland, acre wetland loss, which is obviously pretty huge. If I remember correctly, Florida has the highest uh, acreage of wetland loss in the entire country compared to any other state. We've got a lot of coastline, um, but there's a lot of places that have a lot of wetlands, and Chesapeake Bay is one. Uh, they haven't lost nearly as much proportionally. Over two million acres of seagrass have been lost. And these numbers came before the Florida Bay die-off. They came before the Indian River Lagoon die-off the past few years. So that number is growing as well. In some locations, up to 80% of the oyster reefs are gone. Indian River Lagoon is a great example of that. Charlotte Harbor is unfortunately going down pretty quickly. Um, another drop because of some harvest issues that are going on. Um, and these are all part of the habitat mosaic. So again, it's not just the mangroves, it's all these other pieces of the, of the pie mixing. And you can see with a the picture there, that's taken from uh, Fort Lauderdale. Not only do you have habitat loss from the building, you have a lot of nutrient input from the golf course, which is immediately adjacent to the water. And you might, yeah, sure, you see some mangrove fringing shoreline and some remnant creeks, but I certainly wouldn't call this a, a good quality habitat. Another issue is freshwater flow alterations. Um, that's happening everywhere throughout Florida, um, but especially in South Florida, the Everglades is a good example. And that has to do with three basic things. The timing, the amount, and location of the flow. Even if you had the most pristine, untouched water coming out of Lake Okeechobee, if they're dumping out billions of gallons of freshwater day into the Caloosahatchee and St. Lucie rivers, they're still going to kill everything. That's, it's just death. If you're an estuarine organism, a marine organism, you're pretty much dead unless you can move. Um, and so that's a huge, huge problem about the timing. And you can go through Sarasota Bay, even Charlotte Harbor, Mayaka River with some of the diversion is a big issue. When you change these, you cause ecological damage. It's well documented. Um, so that's another uh, deficit that the fisheries are dealing with. And then the final one is water quality. Um, this picture was taken uh, about six weeks ago in Charlotte Harbor one of the backcountry areas that receives water from what looks like a natural creek, but that creek drains a, uh, a small community, maybe 150 houses. 
So I'd say they're doing a lot of, they probably have septic, which doesn't work very well, and they probably are putting a lot of fertilizer on their lawns. Um, so water quality is a big issue. One is nutrients, as I just talked about. But another one we're finding out is problematic is herbicides and pesticides, because a lot of their residues include things like metals. Uh, we're finding out, for example, that a lot of the uh, herbicides are spreading are uh, copper-based. Um, copper is toxic to invertebrates and causes a lot of reproductive issues with fishes. And that copper uh, sulfate is one of the primary ingredients in the stuff they're spraying to get rid of all the uh, weeds in the ditches. And of course, that goes downstream. Um, a recent study that some colleagues did at FIU found that uh, in some places in Biscayne Bay, the levels of copper in the sediments are many times higher than what, what's allowed um, by EPA standards. Um, and I'm sure it's similar uh, elsewhere. So with that as a cheerful background, <laughs> I'm going to run through a couple of case, some case studies of snook and tarpon uh, as more background on what's, what we've been doing and then hand it over to Joellen to expand uh, on where we're going next. So a lot of you probably already know this, but I'm going to run through it anyway. The snook life cycle, uh, this is Charlotte Harbor, um, Pine Island, uh, my old house right there. The old, the old uh, Charlotte Harbor Field Station right there. Um, essentially, uh, snook spawn along the beaches during the summer, primarily uh, during those outgoing tides in the evening, full or new moons. If you fish the beach, you know where those spots are. The larvae get transported over a couple weeks uh, up into, they find their way up into mangrove wetlands. This has always amazed me. Um, they have to go through basically a wall of mouths from off the beach all the way through the harbor, Charlotte Harbor, across seagrass beds, and then up mangrove creeks to the top of the mangrove creeks. Um, and they're only this size uh, when we first find them up in there, uh, less than an inch long. Then, of course, they grow. As they grow, they start to use that habitat, coastal habitat mosaic, and I'll run through some of that here next. But already you can see some of those connections that I talked about with the habitat mosaic from the beach uh, through having good water quality in the estuary, across the seagrass beds, and up into the, in the mangrove creeks. So uh, what we did starting in 2002 um, is we constructed a pit tag antenna. Um, they'd been used in freshwater for quite some time, but never used in saltwater, because uh, basically uh, the antenna, it's, a, it's electricity, let's say, it's current, in the, and when you have salt water, uh, electricity that, uh, is attenuated so quickly um, that it's typically not seen as a good way to detect things. Um, but we tried it, we modified a bunch of things. Uh, Kirby Wolf, who worked me, with me at the time, it was kind of a genius in, in this type of, of stuff. So basically uh, what they are is toll booths in the creeks. Um, we inserted pit tags um, into this snook, uh, about 2,000 snook for one of the studies, and we could track their movements. And these are the sizes from about uh, six inches and up we tagged. Um, this is uh, one of the creek systems. Um, this is uh, the eastern um, sandbar. This is all seagrass bed through here. You start to get more into the, the mangrove part of the mosaic. Um, and we work up these creeks all the way up, um, and they start to kind of go off the graph. There was one study, there was another. Um, since I this is an older uh, satellite image, but all those uh, mosquito ditches were filled in by DEP as part of restoration based on our research to kind of restore the, the uh, sheet flow. Um, these, these, this pond, this pond, these roundish ponds are natural. Um, I think they're just old sinkholes in the limestone. You see them spotted throughout here. A lot of the old maps, they actually used to look, they were marked as uh, freshwater springs, which really don't happen anymore. So basically what we found with this we looked at one and two year old snook, because at the two year old snook, about 30, almost 35% of them emigrated. Once the rains came in the late spring and early summer, the two year olds, they took off out of the creeks. Um, and we're using that coastal habitat mosaic. And they had a high return rate. Um, I want to say it's 80, 80 something percent of them returned to the same creek where we initially tagged them. One year old snook, they also emigrated, but at a much, much lower rate. Remember, they're much smaller, so the theory is that they don't want to go out into the great beyond because it's pretty high risk of getting eaten. And we did find that, uh, at the same time, we did find that their return rate was much lower than the larger snook. And they could have gotten lost and gone, some, gone somewhere else, but we think it's lower survival because we had these antenna in four different creeks and it was pretty rare for us to see them showing up in, in other creeks that we had, had wired. 
Um, so when they leave those areas, um, they're taking a pretty big risk, but that's part of, um, again, that habitat mosaic. The, one of the key things here is that the site fidelity, or the return, they're used to the same creek, was really high, which means that if you lose a particular creek or portion of shoreline, you're losing a particular portion of your snook population because that's it for them. You know, in the future generations wouldn't even know that population was there, but even the population you have, they go back. And I won't go into the details, but even with adult snook, we find a lot of site fidelity, whether it's spawning grounds or other places. Um, so you get a lot, if you get habitat fragmentation, you're affecting a very specific part of your populations. Another thing we looked at, uh, going back to one of the themes, is freshwater flow alterations. These are the creeks that I just showed you. Their drainage is not pristine by any means, but the flows, from what we could tell looking at all the drainage maps and water flows, was as close to natural as we could get in Charlotte Harbor. In contrast, we have a couple creeks, this one here, that we deemed Culvert Creek because it ended at this borrow pit, which was a culvert. Uh, another, uh, this one, uh, Yucca Pen, that creek looks fine, except the upland drainage had been revised so much that it used to be something like a 30 square mile drainage, it's now 100 and some 150 square miles. So there are times when um, the fresh water would be all the way to the mouth of this creek. It became very flashy flow, kind of like miniature version of the Caloosahatchee River, or some of the guides call it the Calusa Crappy River. Um, so we were looking at fish community over about a 10 year period. We had 60 total fish species, like the sailfin molly and uh, mosquito fish and, and many others. But what we found is that in the natural creeks, we had more species, so higher diversity. We also had higher abundance of all the species. Right? So you call, call that a, a healthier system. But more to um, the focus of people like me who like to fish for snook, um, we also looked at how that affected the snook. So we did lavage, or we puked a lot of snook, um, which is better than the old days when they used to throw in a cooler and open their stomachs. And we found pretty good reflection of what we saw in the fish community. That snook in the natural creeks, when we uh, puked them in the morning, um, had twice as many different prey species in their stomach. They had a more diverse diet. We also found that more than twice as many had full stomachs. In the impacted creeks, a lot of the fish were just empty, even though it was first thing in the morning. Twice as many fish in the natural creeks had something in their stomach. So they're eating more and more diverse. And that, of course, uh, causes things like lower growth, um, lower survival. So already you can see how changes to just the freshwater flows into these creeks without talking about the nutrients and the habitat fragmentation um, can cause issues that reflect in the population. Uh, finally, for snook, just very quickly to hit home that habitat mosaic, as I said, we found a lot of high site fidelity by the adults for spawning. So you look at a spawning spot, and on average, the currents are going to take those larvae to a particular place, wherever that be. So that's going to link the adults and the juveniles, those juvenile habitats, which again, if you lose a particular spawning spot, you're probably going to have implications for particular juvenile habitats in that estuary. What we don't know, um, and people are working on, like the group here at Moat and others, is once they leave those habitats, those juvenile habitats, then where do they go? Do they feed other parts of the population, or do they stick kind of pretty close to this smaller subpopulation uh, area. And we don't know that, answer that question yet, um, but people are looking at it. All right, now I'm gonna switch to tarpon. Um, everybody thinks about, I love giving talks to fishing clubs, show this picture, they get all excited, then we talk about fish this big. <laughs> but unless you have fish this big, you're not gonna have the, the big money makers here. So from research that's been done on tracking fish with satellite tags, from looking for day old larvae, uh, these ovals are uh, four spots that have been identified as spawning locations for tarpon. So places like Boca Grande Pass, Bahia Honda Channel, elsewhere, we think are pre-spawning aggregation locations. They ship, ship offshore 100, 20, 140 miles, in this case, um, to spawn. When they spawn, this is what a tarpon larvae looks like. It floats around for, on average, a month or so, although it seems to have what we call out of plasticity. In its larval duration, it can kind of come in a lot sooner or it can last longer. Um, just some cartoon uh, arrows of possible larval pathways over those 30 days. A colleague, John Schenker, did collect some larvae, tarpon larvae up in Sebastian Inlet. He looked at the otoliths and aged them and looked back at the ocean currents and he figured that they came from off of Boca Grande Pass uh, about uh, four weeks earlier. So you're, again, you're kind of seeing that 
some of that habitat offshore, inshore mosaic. When they come in, um, they don't stop. A lot of times you'll find the snook here, the tarpon keep going and end up in these mucky, stinky places. That's why I don't study the juvenile tarpon in Joe does. <laughs> Sink up to your waist in mud and you found the right spot. Um, this guy, I would used to say that this guy's probably about six to eight months old. But based on a lot of aging stuff we're doing, I have no idea how old this fish is. They don't seem to grow as fast as some of the others, and Joe will talk about that in a bit. As they grow, they kind of expand uh, their use of habitats, uh, larger creeks, um, more like this size. Um, we're doing some tag recapture on these guys in a couple places on the south coast of Cuba, and also uh, Mexico and the Yucatan, uh, two places that are um, protected uh, national parks, no development, nothing in the watershed. So they give us a really good idea of what things are supposed to look like. So when we do studies in Charlotte Harbor or Sarasota Bay or uh, even the Everglades, um, which are all impacted in some way by humans, uh, we can compare and say, do they behave the same way as they, they do in these kind of uh, pristine places? So I'm going to end there as a kind of background on what's a very quick overview of what we've been doing and hand it over to Joellen to talk about what we're doing now and next steps. So a little over a year ago, BTT launched the Juvenile Tarpon Habitat Mapping Project. And at the most basic level, we were looking to find juvenile tarpon spots that were current so that people were finding tarpon pretty recently 12 inches and under because we're really trying to hone in on that nursery habitat. Even though we call it the mapping project, as you can see, there's so many more layers to that. So first we get the spots where there are tarpon currently. Um, then we assess using habitat characteristics and uh, ground truthing, which is kind of our, our field work. Once we uh, get a handle on the natural versus the altered sites that people are giving us, um, those kind of get divided. And so the natural sites, they're typically functioning pretty well already, so we can just protect them. Um, protect them not so much from fishing, but from coastal development, runoff, things like that, uh, changes in water flows, which is a big thing um, in our state that's going on lately. The altered sites, they need a little bit more work. So we can kind of determine um, their need for habitat restoration. Um, and we, we divvy those out by priority and region. But big picture, this is, we're evolving. Our state is evolving on how we manage these fisheries. Um, and no longer are we just looking at, at snook inside the slot limit, but we're looking at other sizes. We're looking at habitat. We're looking at juvenile habitat, which is really important. And a lot of our habitat mapping is done hand in hand with FWC. They're already looking to us to provide these locations for protection and provide this data um, in order to better manage these fisheries. So first we actually have to collect the data and figure out where the sites are. So we use our social media, um, Instagram, Facebook, things like that. Also, uh, I have cards that I pass out to anglers in different fishing shops that say, you always want to include the picture, right? So here's the cool little tarpon. Where are you finding them? Things like that. Um, a lot of fishing clubs have newsletters. Last year, I did the fishing club circuit, and I already divulged to John Ryan um, about the real way to get all the, the juvenile tarpon information. So you go and you give the presentation to the fishing club and say, hey, I'm looking for spots. But in reality, the bar afterwards is where you get most of your, your juvenile tarpon data. Um, we also hooked up with a tournament that takes place in Safety Harbor, a little bit north of here, and they're solely focusing on juvenile tarpon. So it's really how we're able to collect these spots. Then we ask the anglers, okay, what GPS, I need your specific GPS coordinates. None of them are shared. Um, everything is confidential, but we need to know exactly the places that you're looking at for juvenile tarpon, number one, so we can accurately assess the habitat, and number two, so that we know there's not a lot of overlap. Um, a lot of guys, they don't realize this, but they're all fishing in the same place. Um, they don't like to hear that, though, so I say, oh, yeah, I haven't heard of that one. Yeah. <laughs> Also, what size fish are you looking at? Um, this is a big one because originally we're looking at, at juvenile tarpon 12 inches and under thinking, um, as Aaron said, that before that was our, our young of the year stock. But now we're kind of finding out that we really don't know exactly what age classes we are. So if we start 
really looking at the smaller fish, obviously we're, we're getting to the younger fish. Um, and it's also important to know, are there other bigger fish mixed in with the smaller fish? For example, every now and then I hear about eight inch fish mixed in with 10 pound fish. Well, maybe that's not the best nursery habitat um, if you have all these size classes mixed in together. Also, what months out of the year are you catching tarpon at this site? That really, so tarpon, as Aaron mentioned, they're as larvae moving up through these creeks, and some of them are ephemeral creeks, um, but really are they able to use these habitats for multiple seasons or year round, or can they only go there? Are they um, in a ditch during the, the rainy season, but then once the ditch dries up, they're no longer there, right? So probably not the best nursery habitat to be looking at. Finally, we asked them, would you classify this as a natural or an altered system? It's pretty well documented about using anglers um, to get catch data and what size fish they're catching and how many fish they're catching during their trips and things like that. But we're really trying to take it one step further and see if they can accurately assess these habitats, even at the most basic level. So once we put all this data together, we get a map that looks like this, and none of these are real locations, so no need to take a picture of this. As I said, all the information is confidential. Um, but we would get something that looks like this. I put this together for Charlotte Harbor, but uh, these are what the anglers classified as natural habitats versus altered habitats where they're finding juvenile tarpon 12 inches and under. So what we do is we take these sites, um, and then we assess them. So we created this, this characteristics list of what we think is really important for juvenile tarpon nursery habitat. And we did this with the help of uh, researchers at FWRI that looked at habitat suitability models. So a lot of their forte was in GIS modeling. Um, so we kind of divided these characteristics into two groups. The group on the left is ones that we can look at through mapping and GIS, and ones on the right are what we need for in the habitat. So for example, what we can gain from just looking at aerial footage is creek sinuosity. So do we have a curvy creek, which is typically more natural, or is it streamlined, kind of like the Caloosahatchee? Um, the slope, how fast is, is the water rushing out of the creeks? Also, it's important when you're looking at larval transport and tarpon, the distance to first the creek mouth, the open water, so the passes, and finally the shelf edge. Because if their larval period is only so long, that only gives them so much time to make their way up into these potential habitats. Um, daily range of salinity, instead of just taking that single YSI parameter, we wanna know basically how much does it fluctuate throughout throughout the day. Um, and this goes to, is it tidal? And also, is there a fresh water source? Finally, or finally uh, a coldest recorded temperature. Um, so how cold is it getting in these habitats, which is somewhat important to Florida, but also outside of Florida, and that habitat connectivity and fragmentation. Once they immigrate from these nursery habitats, is there nearby opportunity for them um, kind of to shift into that new habitat, that sub-adult, that uh, post-nursery habitat. Once we're out in the field, we look at things like the depth. Um, we think that's kind of important if they're gonna live multiple seasons and potentially multiple years in these nursery habitats that they have a variation of depth as kind of a temperature refuge. Also the presence of the mangrove and the marsh edge. Um, Scale of alteration, right? That's once again, we're looking at, are we natural versus altered systems? And then open limited access. What that really means is, as the tide changes throughout the day, is it constantly open to where fish can swim in and out? Or for example, on a lower tide, is it cut off from the rest of the system? And our YSI data. So for each characteristic, we use a ranking scale of basically three options. And that's really so that we can replicate this for all different locations. If we just kind of start writing in what we think is pertinent, it may change, but this needs to be uniform. We need to have a rubric. So for example, the scale of alteration, we could be looking at none, no alteration, which is your, your uh, natural system. Could be looking at some alteration. So for example, maybe there was, a natural creek, but there's some type of flow that's been changed um, that we could easily revert back to a natural creek or all alteration. I mean, these fish are inside a residential seawall canal community and, and there's no way for them to get out. 
So in our fake case study, uh, the anglers did really well. So we agreed with them on what were natural systems and what were altered systems. Um, so again, what we do is we take those systems and we give those to, first of all, we use the natural sites. We protect those and we give those to FWC. And we say, okay, here are sites that we're looking at. Um, usually your productivity, your recruitment is doing really well in these locations. Um, so just protect these from both coastal development, change in flows, things like that. Once we start getting into the habitat restoration, the priority and region, that really depends on our collaborators. So for example, we can narrow these down by region and say, hey, we want to start looking in Sarasota County. So we're looking at a place that's only going to take a little bit of a, of a restoration change. Uh, for example, it's we want to create a, a sill mouth in this instead of just an open flow, um, things like that, that we can take those to Sarasota County, we can take those to the water management district in that area and say, hey, this will only take a little bit of funding and it'll have a large impact, things like that. So that's how we really narrow it down by priority and region. Now, ultimately, how are we using this data already? Um, even though we've just started the mapping with the assessment, we're already applying it to restoration projects and other monitoring projects that we're already involved with. So the first project that we did for Juvenile Tarpon was called Wildflower Preserve. And this is near Boca Grande, Florida. And we used those, those pit tags like you guys are using in, in Philippi Creek um, in order to figure out what was going on within the system. What we found was that it had Pretty high density, right? So a big population of juvenile tarpon, pretty high survival, but growth was terrible. And when you have a, a system with this high density, high survival, poor growth, typically it's a density issue. You have so many fish packed into the system um, that it's really not functioning at as well as it should or even that well at all. Now, the other thing that this made us aware of is that even though there are juvenile tarpon in a specific habitat does not make it a good habitat. It doesn't make it a nursery habitat. And that's really important to understand. Just because you're finding fish there doesn't necessarily mean um, that it's productive in that sense. So the next restoration project we worked on is called Coral Creek and this is in the Rotunda area and we use the bottom six canals. Um, so Southwest Florida Water Management District, um, this is part of a, a larger effort to, re to uh, restore this, this Coral Creek preserved system and they were going to fill the canals in because that's what was natural. FWC, Charlotte Harbor Lab, they found that there were tarpon in there and also juvenile snook in this canal system. So what we said to them was, hey, let's design this, this habitat and really look at different design types. What these six canals allow us to do is use uh, different designs to see how they compare to each other versus a before and an after restoration. So we can really nail down on the, the first snook recruitment and say, okay, this is beneficial to them. Maybe they don't need those mangroves, but they need a small meandering stream. And as long as they have a limited access canal, that's, that's really what the little guys are looking for. And then they may move to a, a more open system, even within the same nursery habitat um, as they grow older. We're also working on a site that currently doesn't have any juvenile tarpon. Um, this is in Gibsonton, Florida, a little bit south of Tampa, and it was an ornamental fish pond. I mean, it has over 200 of these man-made ponds um, that were dug for aquaculture. So what we're able to do, again, this was a Southwest Florida Water Management District project, um, we're creating this meandering creek system and seeing, okay, can we take a habitat that didn't previously have juvenile tarpon and snook and create this habitat. If, if we make it, if we build it, will they come? That's the mentality when you're looking at this. We can use those habitat characteristics to, to design um, how this creek system should look. And then finally, in, uh, on the East Coast in the Indian River Lagoon, they have a lot of the mosquito impoundments. Now, the thought process behind this is that you fill them up pretty high in the summer, so that way the mosquito can't come in and breed with the larvae. 
which is great for mosquito control, um, but not so much for all the snook and tarpon that were in there because they were shutting off the culverts to allow them to move out of the system. Then they open the culverts in the dry season. Well, as we know, if you look at their life cycle, that's not when they're moving in and out. So initially we pit tagged the fish in the system, allowed um, them to operate the, the, the culverts per normal, and none of the fish left, right, when it came October. So instead we convinced them, okay, go ahead and open up the systems in July. And two weeks in July, we had more fish leave the system than we really expected. So um, by changing these management styles in what we're learning about the biology and what they require in these habitats is really changing the ways, like I said, of how we, we uh, our resource managers are operating. Ultimately, Aaron hit on this a lot, but healthy habitats equal healthy fisheries, right? So if we're looking at these juvenile habitats, that's impacting these adult fisheries, which are our money makers, our money generators. Um, however, as Aaron said, we're already working at a deficit. When you have a species like tarpon, who doesn't mature for eight to 10 years, when you start taking away 50% of the nursery habitat, of the mangroves, of the wetlands, and it's not seen in the adult fishery for decades later, it's already too little too late. So by zeroing in on, on what it really takes for these uh, juveniles, snook and tarpon, we're ultimately impacting the fishery in a big way. All right, with that, I'll bring Aaron up there and we'll, we'll answer any questions that you guys may have. Kathy Bennett's in the room. She was part of this. We did an a, a International Union for the Conservation of Nature assessment, and we classified uh, tarpon as vulnerable, correct? Mm -hmm. um, and that was due to, in the seven, 60s and 70s, there was a really high harvest of tarpon in uh, Mexico, Brazil, and Venezuela. Is that right? 6,000 metric tons a year, something like that? And that's still going on, and so that's part of the whole connectivity thing. But in addition, all the habitat loss throughout the region is an issue. The recreational fishery in, in Florida was kind of a harvest hanging as a trophy until the 80s, some places longer. <laughs> um, so it's not great, not bad, somewhere in between. But it's really hard to track the trends on a fish that's never really been harvested. Right. So we're trying to track the trend, but it's tough. We think a couple things are going on. One is the intense fishing pressure in Buckle Grand Pass, especially associated with a particular tournament, it's no longer, um, really push the fish out. Because as the fishing, and, and it didn't just affect Buckle Grand Pass, all of Charlotte Harbor, the whole patterns of behaviors changed uh, in the tarpon fishery over the, about a 10 year period. Um, and they started to see a lot of a lot more fish in the mouth of a Tampa Bay than they'd ever seen before in other places. Oh. So fishing pressure for sure. Um, and we're doing some acoustic tracking now um, from South Carolina all the way to Texas and the Caribbean to try and see how much fidelity tarpon show. Are they like a snook? Do they keep coming back? But the, the second thing is um, we think that climate change might be having an, an effect. Um, it, it wasn't that long ago that you would find a tarpon in South Carolina, for example. Um, but now the fishery up on the, say, the Georgia coast by Jekyll I mean, I go up there in the summer. The fishery up there is really good. Um, six years ago, before that tournament started, mm -hmm. I think there was one or two guys working in the coast of South Carolina as tarpon fishermen. Now, how many people are in that tournament? Uh, two dozen. Yeah, two dozen guys. They're fishing tarpon regularly, and they start showing up there in June, which is when, you know, that's our peak. And the Keys are seeing different seasonality. February is a lot better than it used to be in March. Um, and then, you know, a lot of times, by the time the tournaments come in June, a lot of the fish are gone. So it's probably a combination. And that makes it a lot harder to estimate the population size. There's, there's no harvest data for a stock assessment, but for population estimates, sometimes you can use genetics. Has there been any thought? Or we just finished a genetic study on tarpon, um, at least the first cut. Uh, Liz Wallace at FWRI, 15,000 
tarpon, something like that. Anyway, a lot. A lot from Florida, from around the region. And looking at seven microsats, uh, she found no uh, managed population structures throughout the region. So that's going to make it super tough, right? If you got fish from Trinidad that are the same genetic population as those from Louisiana, um, which in contrast to two things, there, I think Jerry Alts tagged 350 tarpon with satellite tags. He's never had one go between the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean. Um, and you look at the size structure, most of the Caribbean, they don't get even close to it, as big as in Florida, except some of the rivers in Costa Rica and Nicaragua kind of stuff. Um, the other thing is when you look at the, the larval drift models, 30 days you can go a decent way, but you're not going from Trinidad all the way to here. So it would be a stepwise type of thing. Um, so connectivity in all those different ways is just kind of killing a population estimate. And then Roy Crabtree, when he was doing all the tarpon stuff way back when, they looked at it statistically, and they're too uh, patchily distributed to do any kind of visual assessment. You get a lot of zeros, and then what were they in the past one time? Twenty thousand. Well, that one was based on a, an acoustic survey. Right, but yeah. you could have towed acoustically along the whole beach and gotten fifty fish, and then twenty thousand yeah. or something. Yeah, on on a certain tidal stage, he was up to twenty-two thousand at one point. Yeah. It's, that's so it's tough, but we're hoping that the. Uh, Acoustic stuff with the site fidelity or not gives us can give us an idea on something like that. Have you guys ever seen data that showed a lot of lead <laughs> sitting in the bottom, like on oh, Boca Grande Pass? Yeah, oh, like, I oh yeah, yeah, it's full of lead. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, recently it was a big controversy uh, in Boca Grande Pass. Um, there was a jig that was being used by uh, professional tarpon tournament series. Um, and there are accusations of, that they're using it to snag fish, not to actually catch them. Um, and that resulted in that jig being is now illegal in Florida. Um, interestingly, I don't know about the historical part, but in Boca Grande Pass with that jig, that came from uh, a design that was used up in the uh, Louisiana coast by Coon Swest. Um, and he uses it exclusively as a trolling jig, not a, a bouncing jig. Um, so the jig itself isn't the problem, but the way it's configured, it definitely, if you pull it up and there's a fish, it's going gonna, it's gonna to snag it. Um, but as far as historically, you know, more than, I mean, it was uh, Mark Futch who started using that in the past, in the 90s. So it's not that old in the past as far as I'm aware. It was before that. Actually, before that. It was before that. Mark was using it before that? That was another one. Before. And with the lead issue and the pollution issue, the lead and the way that people fish in Overground Pass, both predominant fishing methods that are used use a breakaway lead. Yeah. It's not just those one gear type, but even those that troll the live bait, they have a they use just a light piece of copper wire and they wrap those like an eight, six, six or eight ounce lead above the swivel and they just have a light piece of wrap wire to hold it in place until the tarpon strikes so that when the fish strikes that little light wire will go and the lead will fly off. So they both contribute lead yeah. to the environment. So to answer your question about um, the depth, uh, because those were artificial ponds essentially they're a little bit higher than what you would consider the water column so when we go to do the habitat restoration it'll be whatever the tidal influence is right so we want they'll find out that mean tide especially they'll have to take into account um, the lower tides in the winter that we experience and how far up the salt water will go up this this creek system um, that we generate now we're also introducing fresh water at the top of the system so that way we'll have the fresh water input kind of that change of salinity throughout the tidal cycle. So it deals more with what the tide is in that specific area. Typically, we're trying to mimic natural systems. So if you have somebody who's um, 500 feet in down the seawall and they put in 20 feet of mangrove shoreline, may not generate the best nursery habitat that we're looking for. It all has to do with that habitat connectivity um, and kind of reducing the fragmentation. So if you have 
an entire canal system that wants to change it to, to look like a natural stream. As far as if they're using mangroves, that's what we're looking at for our designs, mangroves versus salt marsh and, and what's more important as far as, as the vegetation and the ecosystem. But just by planting mangroves in your backyard may not necessarily be increasing nursery habitat. Potentially, that's that's really what we're looking at is, is kind of that connectivity. And um, back out into the estuary as well, right? So if you have a, a one canal that it takes five turns to get to through a canal system, once again, that may not be the best nursery habitat. It's kind of that continuous um, um, ecosystem and, and connection to the other mosaics. Now, as far as when you're looking at adult snook, I mean, most most anglers can tell you that there's no problem finding them in with docks and, and people have mangroves and stuff like that, but that's a little bit different when you're looking at the nursery habitat. Um, if adult snook could get into the one-year-old snook areas in uh, especially winter, overwintering spots, uh, they cannibalize. So that's why um, Joellen was talking some about the, the depths of different depths of the water. Um, some of the places that we worked in Charlotte, or actually most of them, at a spring low tide, you could walk up over certain areas to get to the deeper parts of the creek. Um, so there's some of that uh, kind of refuge as well, not just the mangrove habitat, but all the other parts of the habitat that are around it. Um, so it's a sounds like a simple question, but it's pretty complex. And I know that, and you guys could talk about it more, but to some extent they found some different um, behaviors of juvenile snook in Sarasota creeks than we found in Charlotte Harbor. But that may be some of the more natural versus altered you know, types of ad adaptation that snook. Can we help you? Yes. <laughs> so you can help one of two ways. Either right now you already know of places where there are juvenile tarpon. Um, Two, we've showed you where they like to go, so if you want to go on your own excursion, typically it's much easier to get in by foot or by kayak, so you don't need a boat to do that, but we urge you to go go find these places. And also, you may know some people, now that you've heard this presentation, you'll hear them talking about catching juvenile tarpon and things like that. Um, but that's definitely the best way to help, is we're always increasing our database. Grab one of these cards. Um, it's got all the contact information on it and what to look for. Uh, and the more we can spread that. Here? Yep, we have some of those cards here. Yep. Yeah, we can increase those and in, in wherever you think juvenile tarpon anglers are going, tackle shops, um, certain restaurants, things Actually, like that. spring break now, take all the kids Yeah, go to the beach. And muck around in the, in the swamps. I brought this up just to continue that. Um, what used to happen, and one reason working in the Caribbean, un, untouched places, is to test this. But um, ponds like this, before the ditches uh, weren't connected, were only connected during the wet season. Um, and you can look at look at old uh, University of Florida has a great uh, uh, map archive, aerial photo archive from the 50s. And if you want to see how much this area has changed, you think you know, you don't know until you see those maps. But there, there is these kind of ponds just all over the coastline, and they're ephemerally connected. So that the, the theory is that during the wet season, a lot of rain, higher tides, those larval tarpon, lesser extent snook, could get up into these places. Then during the winter, no rain, lower, lower uh, water levels, they'd get stuck up in these areas. And if they were lucky, the next year, water levels were high and they'd get out. If they weren't lucky, it could be a couple of years, right? We have a drought like in 2008, 2009, they would get stuck. Um, and you can see some evidence of that in some of the golf courses along the coasts. Some of the ponds you see tarpon that are 20, 30 pounds. Um, and they could be just growing normally or they could be really old because they've been stuck in there a long time. So to some extent, it's that type of on and off connectivity that we're trying to figure out how much can we get back to Oh, there's, when we were doing the pit tagging, we'd, do, we'd catch fish by uh, seine, of course, we're also hook and line, fly fishing, um, to get to some of the deeper areas. Um, the creek comes in here through this pond, uh, this old sinkhole, which is good for uh, juvenile tarpon. But this juncture right here um, of that uh, ditch, um, it was too deep and mucky to sample by seine. There was one day on an incoming tide that a, a friend and I um, with fly rods, 
uh, caught, I think it was 88 juvenile snook and tagged them. You know, this catching them, putting them in the thing, tagging them, letting them go, and then we just stopped because we were too tired. <laughs> but that, they can get super dense back in there. But then those deep areas, which artificially deep this far back, are also where we found a lot of cannibalism because the big fish would get back in there. Um, and I think, if I remember the numbers correctly, a big snook that had something in their stomachs, 15% of them puked out a, a whole snook, juvenile snook, they'd eaten within the past hour or so. So it's a pretty high rate of cannibalism in some of those altered systems. But yeah, densities in some of these places that are relatively natural are, are super high. Um, but the growth rate based on the data from this study I didn't show you is also high, so they're doing well. Good question. Generally, in those natural systems, sand means more water flow mm -hmm. than muck. Um, Renee Duffy, who's now at FWRI, did her master's um, matching our fish data with the type of habitat characteristics is this. And my memory is, I'd have to look it up, but that, yeah, there were more juvenile snook in places that had some, some water flow, enough to keep the muck away. But the other thing we found in these creeks is when we used sains to catch fish um, during our normal sampling, it was extremely rare that we'd catch juvenile snook and bigger snook in the same sane. So much so that when I fish the backcountry, um, I'll keep pushing up until I catch small snook. And then I know I'm not going to find any big snook up farther, and so then I'll kind of fish. You used to find the smaller snook in like knee deep water. Yeah. Shallower if you want to look the creek system. Yeah, for sure. And they'll move around a lot depending on if the big snook are around. Um, FWRI, Dave Blewett's here, they catch some of those younger year snook at the creek mouth, but not at times of year that the big ones are around. They kind of, they seem to know that, you know, mom's going to eat them. But no, it's interesting you said that, because as soon as they dredge, you start to see big fish itch, which takes away nursery habitat, too. The first one is when they do beach tree nourishment, no, they don't think of anything. Mm -hmm. um, there have been a, uh, I forget his name, at a Duke University Marine Lab has done some fantastic work on the impacts of beach tree nourishment. Um, You're talking about PPA? <laughs> yeah. Um, based, uh, one of the interesting things about snook is when we were sampling along the beach for snook, during our spawning study, if we sampled early in the morning, um, we'd catch the snook in a seine, and we'd put them in these big holding pens while waiting to tag them. When we emptied that holding pen, and after we'd let all the fish go, it was full of uh, sand fleas, mole crabs. So those snook, at least some of them, were at night eating a lot of mole crabs. When you do beach renourishment, all the mole crabs are gone for years. Um, living on the East Coast now, the guys, I, my neighbors who pompano fish, if there's beach nourishment, they don't even fish that area for three years because there's no mole yeah. crabs. Dr. So, Peterson spoke here and he mentioned how the uh, sand crab sand fleas, got, yeah. sand fleas got covered over and it was just like a dead yeah. zone forever. <clears throat> right. And so, again, if you think about the adult snook, we found, God, it's like 85% level of slight fidelity over, a, I think it was a four year period, three or four year period. So if we tag the snook, if that snook was recaught by us or by fishermen um, on, it, it, during spawning season, it was caught on the same stretch of beach. So if you wipe out that stretch of beach, um, either those snook don't spawn, uh, we didn't find that they would go somewhere else. I mean, Charlotte Harbor, um, the passes, I mean, they're 100 yards wide. They're not like miles wide. They're not super deep. But we didn't find snook crossing those passes even. Um, so if you do beef to nourishment, then you're affecting that portion of the spawning population. <laughs> One of the adva advantageous things to working on things like snook and tarpon and bonefish and permit is that they're worth a lot of money, they're charismatic, uh, so we can, and, they, and they use that entire coastal habitat mosaic. And so we, we can use them from a purely conservation perspective, we use them as what we call umbrella species. Right? You protect them, and you're protecting all that stuff under them. So if we're talking about mangrove creeks, I mean, just getting right down to biology, we, we should probably be focusing on killifish and mosquitofish. But you're never going to get any funding for it, much less any interest in conservation. But for snook and tarpon, you will. Um, so if I was going to make an argument against uh, beach nourishment, it would be, it'd be about snook, it would be about pompano, it wouldn't be about the stuff they eat.